Okay, so what we set out to do here was to review the literature as to whether we think that current grazing management recommendations are going to be suitable for our future grass-based pastoral systems. And we were predominantly focused on uh, looking at perennial ryegrass as, as uh, that's sort of the major thing um, that we have very clear recommendations for. Okay, so the objective of grazing management is to try and maximise the pasture production, the quality, persistence and the herbage utilisation by the grazing animal. So to do that, we've got two main uh, criteria that we can manipulate. The first one is rotation length, and we've got really strong science uh, for individual uh, pasture species looking at the plant level as to what we should do. Um, and then we've also got more at the farm scale level you, the use of, of pasture covers as, as a tool to look not only paddock to paddock but also across farm and use that to uh, set criteria for particular key times of the year like calving or lambing. We've also got uh, post-grazing residual uh, which is the other factor that we can manipulate and current free grazing practice for grass wards is basically to graze down to a 40 to 50 millimetre residual. Okay, so if we're going to look forward to the future, we have to know, well, what is it that we expect is going to be different? So the big one that we've heard lots about is obviously the climate's going to be different. We're going to be hotter, we're going to have more extreme uh, rainfall and windfall events, and also our CO2 concentrations are going to increase. Our farm systems are going to continue to, to change. We're not expecting to see the, the carrier continuation of the intensification that we've seen in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. But in saying that, we are still going to have more intensive systems than we did um, perhaps between the 60s and 90s. Our plant breeding, we're going to continue to have new cultivars available and the and we expect that farmers are going to increasingly utilise the forage value index as a tool to select the optimum cultivar for their property and their particular paddock, and that will also help to drive the, the selection process and the plant breeding. And we're also expecting to see increased awareness and response to environmental challenges. Okay, so what do we actually think might need to change going forward? So if we think about rotation length, currently our pre-grazing covers uh, for farm systems are, are based on optimal management for a diploid pasture, diploid ryegrass species in terms of preventing uh, canopy closure. But if we're going to utilise uh, tetraploid grasses or annual grasses, we've got the potential to actually use, utilise a longer rotation, have higher pre-grazing covers and therefore try and uh, increase the total amount of pasture growing from that area. At the farm scale level, we've actually got a combination of uh, the modern, more winter active cultivars w combined with the warmer winters. We're expecting that actually we might need to have a faster uh, winter rotation, reduce target covers for um, at calving, or alternatively, we might need to have actually farm system changes whereby we realise that we're growing more feed in the winter than we historically did and we might actually need to shift our calving or lambing date forward. We're also, with climate change and, and key stress events, deferred grazing might be a tool that we look to use um, to um, replenish our pastures. So. The key benefit of deferred grazing is that it increases tiller density and it does that through two main mechanisms. The first one is that while the pasture is shut up, it allows it to accumulate carbohydrate in the base of the plant and that can be used to support the uh, growth of new tillers. And secondly, the, it allows the plants to set seed and so we can reseed once conditions allow in that autumn period. So the combined effect of that is increased tiller density and also increase, as a result of that, increased growth in the year following. We've also got some side benefits of that, of deferred grazing in terms of if we shut up a paddock, it means we can help control the, the quality and, and on, the, on the remaining farm area, and we can also use that, that uh, 
admittedly poor quality feed, but it is a feed source to use in a, at the end of a summer drought situation. So I said earlier that post-grazing residuals current uh, management practices to graze down to a 40 to 50 millimetre residual. In actual fact, the science shows that grazing sort of between 40 to 50 millimetres and sort of upwards to about 80 millimetres is okay for um, herbage quality. Um, but in terms of the um, a, a closer defoliation is more stressful on the plant in terms of utilising the energy reserves, reducing root growth and increasing the, the risk to that plant um, in an adverse climate condition. So going forward, it might actually be a, a successful strategy if we lift our, cover, our, our residuals up a bit um, to the upper window so that we've still got the quality, but we're sort of protecting the plants a little bit more. And saying that, the key really is, is consistency. So what we don't want to do is, from one grazing to the next, change the uh, height of our residuals because that puts stress on the plants and it can limit growth. So we need to be consistently achieving um, whatever residual that we're aiming for. In terms of farm systems, in theory, our stocking rates on farm should be matched to our predicted pasture production. But in reality, that's actually getting increasingly difficult to do because our climate's getting so volatile and uh, unpredictable. And as a result, we've got increased risk of overgrazing our pastures. So really the key role of supplement feed, feed is to protect our pastures and to minimise that overgrazing effect. And so in dairy systems, we've got clear guidelines in terms of uh, utilising uh, supplementary feed to protect them so that post-grazing residuals don't go b below about 35 millimetres. Going forward, the timing of, of when and how long we utilise supplements for is going to need to be more flexible. It's not necessarily going to be the set, you know, we use it for one month from June in, in winter and in this period in summer. It's going to need to reflect our volatile climate and be utilised as a um, for primarily for protecting those pastures so that once we are through the adverse effect, effects, we still have our pastures there. In terms of uh, pasture species, we heard yesterday about the invasion of the subtropical uh, C4 grasses, and that's going to continue to spread south with the climate change. We've got two main um, recommendations in terms of grazing management. The first is that we want to, first of all, try and minimise that spread. Uh, but secondly, once our pastures do become dominated with those species, we need to look at grazing management op options to try and maximise the animal performance of um, swards that contain those species. We're going to continue to see increased use of diverse uh, pastures, as we have with plantain and, and chicory um, in the last 20 years. And while we're doing that, we're going to have to have continued learning about an adjustment with our grazing management so that we manage them in a way that keep those, those species that we want to be in there in there, as opposed to allowing premier ryegrass to dominate and outcompete other things. Okay, so in summary, are the current grazing re management recommendations suitable for the future? Yes, the science principles are pretty robust, but there will need to be some tweaks. In terms of on-farm management, it's likely that it might get more complex because we might need to utilise a range of policies uh, within our farming systems in order to increase that flexibility and, and resilience. Um, but in saying that new science is always good and, yeah, so we want to continue with that.